It was only a 40 minute drive to Sylvia's mum and dad's house. If she got Timmy up early enough in the morning while they were staying with their parents, uh, she could easily drop him at school before heading into the office. Right now though, she had to admit she was enjoying driving in the opposite direction of her worries. It felt good being out on the open road listening to music with the windows rolled down, with Timmy napping in his booster seat. Sylvia felt like she was literally uh, leaving her problems behind. Sylvia had grown up in a modest two-bedroom house out in the country. Her parents owned a couple acres of land and put out a big garden every year. Just seeing the familiarity of the place made her feel calmer than she had felt in days. Mum greeted them at the door with hugs. You two get in here, she said, shooting them. Uh, sorry, shooing, <laughs> shooting them. <laughs> shooing them into the house. Uh, Timmy, you're growing so fast. We're going to have to put a brick in. <laughs> what is going on? Oh, I, my mind has gone completely crazy. Um, Sylvia's mom made this joke almost every time she saw Timmy, but he was still polite enough to laugh. Don't put a brick on my head, Nana. And Sylvia, you look tired and thin. Her mom always carried a little extra weight and expressed worry that Sylvia tended to be slightly underweight. We'll get you fed and rested up while you're here and we'll make sure Timmy gets plenty of fresh air and sunshine. That's the best therapy there is. Thanks, mom. Sylvia was pretty sure that fresh air and sunshine wasn't the only kind of therapy Timmy needed, but she was still grateful for her mom's affectionate welcome. When they walked into the living room, Sylvia's dad said, Hey, there's my Timbo. Get over here. He opened his arms for a hug, and Sylvia was relieved to see that Timmy obliged. Then Dad hugged her too, and half whispered, Your mum told me about the creep that was hanging around last night. I worry about you living there in the city all by yourself. You ought to think about having an alarm system put in. I'll definitely think about it, Sylvia said. Since her parents had always lived in the country, they tended to think of the small city where Sylvia lived as full of danger. The thing was... Crime and noise had never scared her. It was the unknown that she feared, the threats she couldn't adjust for, and this week had been full of them. For dinner, Dad had grilled steaks, and Mom had made mashed potatoes and a huge salad. The four of them sat together at the dining room table. No salad for me, please, Timmy said. But you usually love this salad, Sylvia's mum said. It's the kind with the mandarin orange slices and dried cranberries. I don't like salad, Timmy yelled. Sylvia watched her mum and dad exchange an uncomfortable look. Mum, dad, maybe it would be a good idea to remind Timmy of some of the fun things he gets to do while he visits here. Well, Timbo, her dad said, sounding like someone trying to <laughs> trying a little too hard to be cheerful. You know how you've always liked helped it. <laughs> you know how you've always liked helping me out in my workshop. I thought while you're here, we well, we might go out there. And work on a building, a birdhouse. You can take it home with you and hang it on a tree in your yard. And then later, Sylvia's mum chimed in, I thought we might bake and decorate some sugar cookies. Timmy looked back and forth between his grandparents. Does that sound like fun, Timmy? Sylvia prompted him. Building a birdhouse with Pop Pop and then baking cookies with Nana? Uh-huh, Timmy said. Sylvia felt an overwhelming sense of relief. Good. But right now, Timbo, Sylvia's dad said, you should eat your steak. The protein will make you big and strong. He looked at Timmy's plate. Oh, I see your nana just gave you a butter knife. That's no good for cutting a real piece of meat. Let me help you. He got up and approached Timmy, holding a sharp steak knife. <laughs> Timmy sprang from his seat and tackled his grandpa. <laughs> knocking him to the floor and wrestling the knife from his hand. No, don't hurt Timmy, don't hurt Timmy. What in the world? Sylvia's mum cried. Sylvia pulled Timmy off her dad and peeled Timmy's fingers off the knife. Are you okay, dad? She asked. Her heart was pounding in her chest. Sylvia's dad pulled, up, uh, pulled himself up to a sitting position. I'm not hurt, just rattled and confused. <laughs> confused. He looked at Timmy. Son, I wasn't going to hurt anybody with that knife. I was just going to help you cut your steak. God. Children in Fortnite these days. I just saw your knife, Timmy said. And I had to protect the others. I 
don't understand. Who were you trying to protect? Sylvia's mum asked with a tremor in her voice. Timmy looked at his grandmother as though she had just asked a really silly question, but refused to say another word throughout dinner. After Timmy was finally in bed, Sylvia sat in the living room with her parents. She wasn't surprised that there was tension in the air. She knew they were upset over Timmy's behaviour at dinner. I'm sorry about what happened, she said. It's not your fault, her mum said, patting Sylvia's arm. Whatever the trouble is with Timmy, it's not your fault. What's important is that he's getting the help and support he needs. We also are concerned that you're getting the help and support you need. What do you mean? Sylvia asked. Sylvia asked. Your mum and I were talking about after you called last night, Dad said, his brow creased with worry. And we just want you to know that if you and Timbo want to move back in here with us, you're more than welcome. Even after what happened at dinner? Silvery. Sylvia asked. I keep wanting to say silver. Uh, her, her dad smiled. Even after what happened at dinner, he didn't mean to hurt me. He was just trying to protect himself. I'm just sorry he thought he needed protection from me. Well, Sylvia said, she hadn't seen this idea coming. I mean, thanks for your offer. That's very generous, but I have a job in the city and Timmy has school. Sylvia's dad smiled at her. We've got an elementary school here too. You should know. You went to it, and I'm pretty sure I could talk Bill Davis into giving you a job at the feed store again. He always says you are the one of the best workers he's ever had. Sylvia was having a hard time imagining going back to her, her rural life. This is really sweet of you, but I mean, this is a two-bedroom house. You don't want Timmy and me here crowding you out. Well, you living here would just be a temporary arrangement, Mum said. I'm sure in time we could find a little house for just you and Timmy. You certainly have put a lot of thought into this, Sylvia said. Well, we worry about you living in the city by yourself, Dad said. You've got robbers or worse trying to break into your house. Your eight-year-old son is all confused and talking about murders. It's time for you to come home, Sylvie. And if you did come home, Mum added, we could help a lot with Timmy. I can't imagine how hard it is to be a single parent, especially to a child who's, she paused, seeming to search for the right words, having problems. I appreciate the offer, Sylvia said, and I'll definitely think about it. Of course, Mum said. It's not the kind of decision you'd want to rush into, she stood up. Well, your dad and I are probably going to turn in. Bedtime comes early here in the country. What was now called the guest room had been Sylvia's room when she was a kid. Being there as an adult always felt strange. Now the room was decorated with a few tasteful floral prints on the wall, but Sylvia could remember when the walls had been papered with posters of her favourite pop stars and the bookcase had been full of paperback kids' mysteries and she'd brought at the school book fair. It was strange enough being in her old room. It was even stranger to think of moving back here with Timmy. She tried to picture herself working at the feed store where she had worked when she was in high school and community college. As soon as she'd graduated, she had moved to the city, gotten a job in a law office and met Timmy's dad. If she moved back here, it would feel like none of those things had ever happened, like no time had passed at all. As Sylvia took her pyjamas out of her overnight bag, she heard a dog barking outside. Soon it was a chorus of dogs, more dogs than she already, uh, than she had ever, sorry, than she had even known were in this country neighbourhood, woofing and yipping and baying with no signs of stopping. She wondered what the dogs were responding to. Given her recent experiences, she feared an intruder, but here it was more likely to be a possum or a raccoon. She left her pyjamas on the bed and went out to the back porch to see what was going on. Out here, the barking was almost unbearably loud and constant. It didn't sound like any of the dogs were even stopping to take a breath. Her parents' hound dog, Boo, was standing outside the doghouse in his fenced lot, barking non-stop in his deep hound's bellow. Sylvia looked around but could see no cause of the canine chaos. She went back inside. On her way to the guest room, she decided to look in on Timmy and see if all the noise had woken him. She peeked through the doorway of the little sewing room where her mum always set up his fold-out bed. The bed was there, but Timmy was gone. The bed was rumpled, as if he had thrown off the covers. Sylvia's heart was pounding. Maybe he'd just gone to the bathroom. But then she saw the open window. It definitely had been shut when she had tucked him in for the night. 
Sylvia ran to the window and looked out, uh, and looked out it for signs of Timmy. I just realised, is this a uh, midnight motorist? Kind of like parallel? Because of the, uh, the open window? I, I guess not, but... <laughs> uh, halfway across the length of the backyard, a large shadowy figure walked, holding a small boy by the hand. Oh, actually, it could be. It could be a midnight motorist parallel. Timmy! Sylvia screamed. Timmy! But her voice was drowned out by the sound of the barking dogs. With the strength and agility that only comes during an emergency, Sylvia climbed out the window. She hit the ground running, chasing Timmy and the shadowy captor. But even though Sylvia was running and Timmy and the shadow thing were just walking, she still couldn't catch them. They were always just out of reach, like the pool of clear water imagined by the uh, parched person crawling across the desert. Timmy! She yelled again, but her son didn't even turn around. Suddenly a pair of hands grabbed Sylvia and put her into the bushes. She screamed, though she knew no one would hear it over the dogs going crazy. The man standing before her and holding her arms was strangely familiar. Suddenly she recognised him as the man who was in her yard supposedly searching for his lost dog. Looking at him, she realised that the face in her kitchen window the night before was also his. You, she said. You followed us all the way out here? She was crying and flailing around, trying to break free of his grip. What do you want from us? I want you to listen to me. That's all, he said. I'm not going to hurt you. Just take some deep breaths and listen. His tone was gentle. Oh, never mind. But he didn't relinquish uh, his grip of her arms. How do you know I can trust you? She, she asked. Her breathing was shallow, like a scared rabbit's. You don't, he said. But just give me a chance. My name is Mike. I'm a security guard at the old Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. The building got broken into a few weeks ago. And one of the things stolen was the head of an animatronic bear. Your son got a mask like that for his birthday, right? Sylvia was a riot of emotions, with fear and confusion topping the list. Still, she managed to nod. <laughs> Mike! <laughs> it's Michael Afton! It has to be Mike Schmidt! Old Freddy's but security guard! <laughs> this is like crazy! Uh, <laughs> Listen, I know this sounds crazy, but that mask may have harmed your son. The only way to reverse the damage is for me to take it back. Then please take it, Sylvia said. Tears were pouring down her cheeks. Was the Freddy mask the cause of Timmy's problems? But how could it be? It didn't make sense. Mike smiled sheepishly. Well, to tell you the truth, I already took it. After you and Timmy left the house today. It was the only object in your home that I touched, I promise. Okay, Sylvia said. So you got the mask back, by breaking and entering. But how do I get my son back? He was led off into the woods by that thing. I think I know where to find him, Mike said. Come with me. Sylvia was expecting Mike to lead her into the woods. But instead, he led her to his car. Hop in, he said. Despite the instincts screaming at her from every mystery novel she'd ever read, Sylvia did as she was told. She was very aware that she didn't really know Mike and didn't know if she could trust him. But he said he could help her find Timmy, so she was willing to take her chances. What other choice did she have? She couldn't exactly tell the police that her child had been abducted by some kind of shadow monster. Mike drove through the city and into a neighbourhood that had seen better days. Old stores sat empty, their windows broken and patched with electrical tape. Mark Pi uh, Mark Mike parked across the street from a dilapidated abandoned building that looked like it had once been a restaurant. I reckon this is, uh, this is also Jeff's Pizza. This is the same, I reckon this is the same pizzeria from, like, Jeff's Pizza. Um, actually, maybe not. I was just thinking, because the city had, like, br like, broken, patched, the w windows broken and patched with electrical tape and stuff. I was wondering, because, like, in, into the pit, obviously, the mill had closed and the town had been, like, run down. It was as dead as a possum, you know? Anyway, um... Is this the place? Sylvia was growing even more uneasy. Why would Timmy be here? Was Mike tricking her? Had he brought her to this abandoned place because he was really a ser serial killer? Yep. The old Freddy Fazbear's, Mike said. What's left of it? In a twisted way, things were starting to make sense. This is where the murders happened all those years ago? Yeah, Mike said. Come on, we're going inside. He reached into the back seat and produced the Freddy Fazbear mask. When she had 
bought the mask for Timmy. She thought it was cute and comical. Now, when she looked at it, she wondered how she could ever have had that opinion. The empty eyes, the ghoulish grin, the thing was terrifying. Mike sprinted across the street toward the crumbling structure, and Sylvia followed. When Mike unlocked the door, it opened with a creak like a horror movie sound effect. He turned on his flashlight and gestured for Sylvia to follow him. Together they walked through a winding hallway, the pitch blackness of which was... Uh, of which was interrupted only by the beam from Mike's flashlight. The walls were decorated with fading pictures of Freddy Fazbear and other animal characters. Their smiles seemed strangely ma malevolent to Sylvia. At last, they came to a, a large open room. Mike aimed his flashlight at the back wall, where, set upon a small stage, Timmy stood between an animatronic rabbit and an animatronic chick. Bonnie and Chica, Sylvia thought. That's what Timmy had called them. The animatronics were moving their mouths to some horrible recorded song that had, grown, that had grown tinny and indistinct with age, but Timmy apparently still recognised it because he was singing his heart out. <laughs> what are we waiting for? Get him down from there, Sylvia said, running toward the stage. No, don't do it, Mike yelled, before Sylvia could reach the stage. Black and white striped tentacles shot from the cracks in the wall and with lightning speed wrapped around Sylvia's arms, legs and waist. Another tentacle sneaked its way around her neck, stopping just short of strangling her. Sylvia s struggled against her restraints, but they only bound her tighter. She was immobilized. That's right, my friends. The puppet is here. <laughs> oh, now do you understand why this is such a good story? <laughs> Finally, I've waited all series for a puppet story, <laughs> and it's the last story, and it's a scrapped story. Oh my god! Oh, uh, psychic, <laughs> psychic! If you're listening to this, you probably had the same reaction as me, right? <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna keep reading. Uh, we're so close to the end, by the way. I can't believe, like, there's, like, nothing else to this. Uh, what the? Mike yelled, running towards Sylvia. He tugged on the tentacle that had a dangerous hold on Sylvia's neck. It didn't budge. Don't worry about me, Sylvia said. Save Timmy! Not yet, Mike said in a half-whisper. What do you mean? Sylvia said. Just give it one more minute, Mike muttered. The awful, broken-sounding recording was reaching some kind of crescendo. Uh... I, I don't know how to pronounce that word. I think I pronounced it right. Timmy's singing grew louder and louder. Mike leaped onto the stage and put the Freddy Fazbear mask over Timmy's head. As soon as the mask was in place, its eyes lit up with an eerie glow. Mike yanked the mask from Timmy's head, threw it aside, then grabbed Timmy and pulled him off the stage. A panel opened in the ceiling above them, and down came a doll-like feature with a skinny black clad body and a clownishly painted face with empty black eye sockets. Its limbs were long and snaky and black and white striped. Michael looked up at the monstrous figure, his mouth open in an unheard scream. He covered Timmy's body with his own to protect him. The figure stopped in midair and as Sylvia, Timmy and Mike looked on, another figure walked across the room and took his place on the stage between Bonnie and Chica. Freddy Fazbear wearing the head Mike had just returned. The tinny music started to play again, and the horrible doll-like creature disappeared back into the hole in the ceiling, taking the tentacles that had bound Sylvia with her. Sylvia took one of Timmy's hands, and Mike took the other. They ran and didn't look back. Wow. Such a good section. <laughs> Once they were in the car, all panting for breath, Mike asked Sylvia, do you want to go home or back to your parents' house? I want to go home, Timmy said from the back seat. You heard the kid, Sylvia said. She would text her parents to let them know they were okay. She could figure out how to get her car back tomorrow. What? What exactly happened back there? Mike pulled the car out into the road. All I know is that something was alive in that Freddy Fazbear head, and when Timmy put it on, that living thing went inside him. That's why I felt weird, Timmy asked. Exactly, Mike said. Sylvia shook her head. This was all too strange to take in. But what was the shadow thing? The shadow knew that the living thing was inside Timmy. I think it was trying to get it out. 
Mike briefly took his eyes off the road to look back at Timmy. You know that all of this has to stay a secret. You can't tell anybody. You got that, buddy? I got it, Timmy said. Mike looked over at Sylvia. That goes for you too. Sylvia felt an unexpected laugh bubble up. Who would believe me? The next morning, Sylvia was so happy to have Timmy home that she got up early to make his favourite chocolate chip pancakes. She had to call him five times to get him to wake up. And when he finally came down the stairs, his eyelids were droopy and he was yawning. It filled Sylvia's heart with joy to have him home and safe. What would you say to some chocolate chip pancakes? She said. Timmy gave a sleepy smile. I would say that sounds great. Sylvia smiled back at him. The voice he had spoken in was definitely his own. And what would you say if I said that because we had such a rough night, we should stay home from work and school and spend the night together, uh, the day together? Timmy smiled wider. I would say that sounds even greater. <laughs> I'm crying! <laughs> That's the end of Fazbear Frights! <laughs> oh... That's the end. No more Fazbear Frights, guys. You have done it. You've read through every single story. Probably, anyway. <laughs> Unless you're waiting for me to cover the fetch stories. <laughs> oh my god. That story is genuinely A plus tier. At least, like, at least A plus tier. Uh, or at least A. Like, that is such a good story and freaking hell i don't know why that's a scrapped story i don't know i don't really truly know why any of these are scrapped stories they're still really good stories and the thing about this one that bugs me is yes it's scrapped but technically it's canon <laughs> and it's like um and let me just give a little brief uh explanation for that uh essentially the kids that timmy saw is essentially exactly the same image as we were described in Into the Pit. And not only that, I, th I actually think that that place that uh, Mike and Sylvia went to, I, I actually think that was, you know, a form of that pizzeria or Jeff's Pizza or something. I don't know how that fits into the timeline though, because both of them were technically 30 years after the incident. Um, but I'll have to figure that out. Uh, but also uh, adding on to that is, Larson in the Stitch Wraith Stinger where he like goes into the pit loads of times or whatever uh, and sees loads of different memories uh, is uh, Larson actually goes into Timmy's bedroom I believe you're I, you're gonna have to do some research on that uh, I'm gonna have to do more research on that but I believe there are a few ways in which this connects to the rest of the Fazbear Fried stories which is pretty epic but it is a scrap story so that's kind of confusing um Guys, I tell me what you thought of this story. This was excellent. This was exactly what I wanted in a Fazbear Fright story. This is exactly the way I wanted it to end. Um, the puppet came out of nowhere, quite literally. And it was a fantastic reveal. And I'm so glad that the puppet finally got a story. Because the puppet, to me, is a very underrated character. Underused character. Uh, I don't even know why the puppet isn't in FNAF AR yet. Oh, I, I know why. Uh, Freaking Illumix. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm going to stop talking because that is the end of the, uh, the audiobook. But guys, seriously, if you have been using my audiobooks, thank you so much. I, I am on the verge of tears because this is ending. Um, it's been a great ride. I will see you in Tales from the Pizzaplex. Uh, I might even cover the novels, the original trilogy. Tell me if that's something that you want. Because uh, I do need to reread them. <laughs> but um, yeah, this has been a great journey. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, and yeah, I will see you in Tales from the Pizzaplex. And when I finish the Fetch audiobooks <laughs> eventually. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah. I will see you later. Goodbye.